Hello and welcome to The Point World Affairs, I'm Cha Sang-mi. The results of the U.S. midterm elections show that the American political landscape is as polarized as ever. The Democrats seized the control of the House, while the Republicans solidified their majority in the Senate. We discussed the future trajectory of Donald Trump's presidency post-elections and how this could affect Washington's foreign policies, including those pertaining to the Korean Peninsula. For that, we have with us Dr. James Kim from the Asan Institute for Policy Studies. Thank you for joining us today. Good to be back. Let's watch this short clip before we jump into the questions. The Democratic Party regained control of the House in eight years. As the American people voted on all 435 seats in the House of Representatives, 35 Senate seats, and some state governors. The Republican Party, on the other hand, is still in control of the Senate, as they actually increase their majority. Unlike previous midterm elections, this national referendum drew a record number of voters to the polls and opened the door to tougher oversight of the White House over the next two years. While the anti-immigration sentiment in the U.S. helped the GOP win the Senate, hate crimes like the gun violence in Pittsburgh triggered voters of the opposition party to hit the polls. But despite losing the House, President Donald Trump claimed victory as his divisive campaigning in the weeks ahead of the election may have paid off for the Republicans, who won key Senate races where the Democrats had hoped to contend. The Republican Party defied history to expand our Senate majority while significantly beating expectations in the House for the midterm and midterm year. The dramatic conclusion of the most expensive and consequential midterms in modern times fell short of delivering the sweeping repudiation of Trump, wished for by the Democrats. But retaking the House still portends serious changes in Washington, as this would block the Republicans from passing new laws and give Democrats the ability to conduct real investigations on his personal finances and potential ties to Russia. Also, the divide within the new Congress is predicted to deepen over the next two years, as neither side has won a clear victory in this round of midterm elections. How will this new political situation affect President Trump's various foreign and economic policies for the remainder of his term? Also, how would this affect denuclearization talks in the Korean Peninsula? We discuss all these on this week's The Point World Affairs. James, we know that the Democrats seized control of the House and the Republicans got to keep the Senate. So, and this was seen as a referendum on Trump, more like, even though he was not on the ballots. And so, what do you think this is, the evaluation of President Trump is after the midterms? Well, there was a survey um, that was conducted by the Associated Press, um, along with, I believe it was University of Chicago, um, right before the election, looking at about 115,000 um, potential voters. And, um, and the question that they were asking was, you know, what, uh, what is the overriding, the most important issue why you will vote um, in November um, this year? And um, of the 115,000 uh, respondents, about two-thirds um, um, named Donald Trump as the main reason for why they were going to vote in November. Um, so 67% uh, of the surveyed respondents, which was a representative sample of the American public, said that it was about President Trump. And then the next, it was interesting what, what came after that. It wasn't the economy. 20, 25, 26 percent um, named health care, mm -hmm. and then another 23 percent or so named immigration. Um, and then came the economy, and it was less than 20% of the reasons for why the voters came out to vote. Clearly, this was a, about President Trump, and it wasn't about the economy. It was more about the potential changes in policy that may come in the coming two years after the midterms. And these were, um, you know, issues that had to do with health care and also immigration. So um, it, was, uh, it was a loss for President Trump overall. But uh, uh, the loss wasn't as big as um, some of the, you know, uh, mainstream media had suggested that there was going to be a, a blue wave. Democrats uh, essentially um, turning over both, potentially, um, 
the House and the Senate um, um, towards the Democrats against the president. But that didn't happen. And the reason why that didn't happen was because the, uh, the districting for the seats um, in each of these districts were drawn in favor of the Republicans in the last decennial census in 2010. And so the Democrats had an uphill battle uh, for the House. Um, and in the Senate, the Democrats had more seats that they had to defend against the Republicans. And most of them were contentious seats. So Republicans actually gained seats in the Senate. Um, but uh, the, the, despite the fact that the, uh, the voting districts were drawn against the Democrats' favor, they still did fairly well by coming out with the majority. And if you look at past midterms, clearly doesn't match up to the kind of losses that the president's party suffered. I mean, in 2010, for instance, uh, President Obama, with about 43 percent approval rating, lost over 60 seats in the House um, and, uh, you know, close to six seats in the Senate. Uh, President Clinton in 1994, in his first midterm, uh, lost 52 uh, seats in the House uh, for the Dems and uh, eight seats in the Senate. We didn't see that kind of result here. We see somewhere, I mean, give or take, uh, with all the contentious votes that are happening in some of these uh, districts, uh, we'll have to wait and see exactly what the numbers are. But clearly, uh, Democrats just made the majority. And it looks like, you know, 30, give or take, four. Uh, so uh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, but the Democrats got the job done. Clearly, it was a, man, it was a referendum against Donald Trump. Right. Uh, it seems like uh, you're right. It was it was a, it could be said a loss for President Trump, even though you said it was really good turnout for uh, the Republicans because uh, President Trump actually tweeted right after the midterm polls closed. He said it was a tremendous success for him and his uh, people. How about some agenda and some policies that's going to uh, shift now from, that the uh, Democrats are now taking control of the House? Well, as I've said, um, if you take a look at President Trump's first two years and you take a look at some of the policy agenda that he had in place, he got a lot done actually. You take a look at on the environmental regulation side, a lot of deregulation happening on the environmental side. So a lot of the Obama policy um, being drawn back on the environment. On tax reform, uh, monumental um, uh, bill on tax where he was able to lower the corporate tax rate by over 10%. Uh, the economy is doing very well as a result of that. He was able to get the U.S. out of TPP. Um, he has, but he's also renegotiated and got a lot of trade deals done. Um, as you know, Chorus FTA uh, was redone. Uh, he's getting the European um, NATO allies to pay up more uh, in contributing more to um, their defense spending. So um, President Trump was uh, relatively very successful on many fronts, but on certain issues that he campaigned on, he still had problems. One was obviously immigration and immigration reform. The other was repealing the Obama health care reform. And he failed on both of those um, uh, fronts. The Republicans were adamant about pushing forward with that and even doing more um, after the midterm. Uh, but it, he is now, with the split Congress, it's going to be difficult uh, for the Republicans and President Trump to be able to push that um, agenda uh, along. So I, I don't think we're going to see many changes there. Um, so on domestic fronts, on key policy reforms, as steady as she goes, we're not going to get a rollback on the Trump reforms from the first two years, but we're not going to get any more um, done on the agenda that President Trump has before the presidential election in 2020. He's also going to be embroiled in a domestic, let's put it this way, oversight scandal. Um, he has many issues here having to do with his tax return, his family, um, nepotism is another issue uh, that uh, potentially is being linked to the emoluments clause. Um, he has, you know, the ongoing investigation on, on Russia. And then all this criticism about the linkage with Saudi Arabia. Um, that you can bet that the Democrats are going to be moving on all of these fronts to exercise their oversight powers over the president. That means that um, they will subpoena certain members 
even uh, a call for certain kinds of um, evidence. And the president is going to be very busy um, dealing with this legal problem. Um, and it's not clear whether or not he's going to be able to focus on any other agenda um, that's on, on, on the ticket right now. So um, w basically, we're going to see a policy gridlock and the president under siege for the next two years uh, if the Democrats have their way. So it's going to be a difficult two years for President Trump. Let's connect to Steve Herman, VOA News White House Bureau Chief. Good to see you again, Steve. My pleasure. Don't the election results fall short of the anticipated landslide victory, the so-called blue wave for the Democrats? Yes, uh, the Democrats were expecting uh, what they were hoping to be a blue wave. But uh, Republicans who have been deriding this as a mere trickle, uh, perhaps that's not the most accurate assessment. Uh, we have to emphasize that uh, it, it was uh, certainly mission accomplished for the Democrats. They were able to regain control of one of the, uh, the houses of Congress, the House of Representatives. That means that there are a number of gavels of committees that pass from Republican chairs to Democrats. And that gives them all sorts of an investigatory power, uh, the ability to issue subpoenas for all sorts of uh, people in the White House and members of the president's uh, cabinet. Uh, this is something extremely significant, uh, considering uh, what we have with uh, the controversies of this particular administration. And Steve, there has been a lot of issues before talking about this midterms and, uh, for, for instance, the immigration issue, the care of immigrants and a lot of border fears. Uh, President Trump was focusing on that, as well as the uh, this, the shooting rampage at the synagogue in uh, Pittsburgh. So what do you see as the most critical issue uh, for this midterms? Well, I think the most critical issue was Donald Trump himself. I, I don't think uh, these campaigns really swayed uh, too many voters uh, uh, who were on the fence about which party they were going to vote for. I think the difference that it made was actually motivating people to get to the polls. For Democrats, yes, uh, Donald Trump's uh, rhetoric uh, about uh, uh, immigration uh, certainly uh, uh, made a difference, uh, concerns about health care. Uh, but on the other hand, I think for uh, Trump supporters, he went around and did all these rallies. I attended a number of them uh, around the country. They were uh, uh, kind of like a rock concerts uh, <laughs> to some degree, and uh, they motivated of uh, some of his base who may have stayed at home uh, to get out. And I think a major factor for them was uh, the treatment uh, that the uh, justice uh, for the Supreme Court, uh, Brett Kavanaugh, uh, got uh, during uh, that whole uh, congressional escapade. And uh, basically, uh, what we have seen is um, senators uh, who uh, dared uh, to defy uh, the president's wishes uh, were defeated, who were up for re-election. Also among Republicans, those that the president uh, campaigned for on the Senate side won re-election. So Donald Trump did make a difference. That message is really driven home, leading now up to 2020 uh, for uh, congressional uh, candidates. And the impeachment, it was discussed remotely as a possibility leading up to the elections. So do we still see this possibility? Yes, it's, it's absolutely possible because they have the numbers to do this. However, if uh, Nancy Pelosi is back as uh, Speaker of the House in January uh, and other uh, senior members of the uh, Democratic Party in the House, uh, they really don't seem to be inclined to talk too much about impeachment right now. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the wiser heads in the Democratic Party uh, want to wait uh, for the uh, results of the Mueller investigation. Uh, then they could move forward. There's going to be a tremendous amount of investigations, though, uh, by Democrats looking into everything from the alleged collusion between Russia and the 2016 Trump campaign, 
uh, the personal uh, use of email in the White House by uh, administration staffers. There's probably about a half a dozen investigations that would be launched. But impeachment, uh, although you have a lot of these uh, uh, first-time uh, Democrats coming into the Congress who will want uh, some blood, uh, the, the leadership, however, realizes that unless they're able to remove Trump from office in a bipartisan effort, which would require the Republican-controlled Senate to move to, by two-thirds vote, to remove the president, that really this could backfire, because then you give Trump something to really rally his base in 2020, perhaps uh, whether or not he wins re-election, that could allow the Republicans to retake control of, um, of, the, of the House of Representatives. So impeachment is really a double-edged sword for the Democrats at this point. And we should also mention that impeachment doesn't mean uh, a removal of the president. Uh, Bill Clinton was impeached and stayed in office. So uh, I think Donald Trump, if he were to be impeached uh, by the House, would wear it as a badge of honor going into the 2020 election. Thank you. That was Steve Herman from VOA News. Now, James, um, tell us about Nancy Pelosi. She was uh, also a speaker before. So she mentioned after uh, the polls closed that she will make sure to put institutional check on the White House. So what do you think this means? Do you think uh, it will be very difficult for President Trump now post-election? Right. If, if she's signaling that the Democrats in the House are not going to um, make any um, haphazard deals with the president um, on key issues. Um, at the same time, I think she's also suggesting there that the Democrats will exercise to the fullest extent their oversight powers uh, to check the president. It's going to be difficult uh, for President Trump to push his agenda. But that's not to say he's going to be completely um, tied down. Uh, as we, as you noted earlier, um, the Senate is still on the president's side, and the president, uh, through the Senate, can do certain things that uh, where he doesn't need to uh, work through um, the House. So one is obviously um, uh, in the area of making treaties, uh, and Senate is uh, largely involved confirming and affirming those treaties. Um, federal appointments for cabinet posts, as well as uh, for federal judges. Um, those seats um, don't, do not need to be consulted um, uh, uh, with uh, the Democrats in the House. Uh, that's all in the Senate as well. Um, and we're leaving out um, a, um, a third possibility here that the president could try to do certain things on his own unilaterally using the executive order power, using his executive powers to try to influence um, immigration policy and also health care policy. And if the Democrats try to do anything in reaction to that by passing new legislation, they're going to be met with an opposition in the Senate by the Republicans. The president may decide to exercise some of his unilateral powers, which is not um, completely unimaginable given um, you know, how Donald Trump um, went about um, conducting his first two years of his term. Let's get more analysis on the midterm election results. We connect with Donald Green, professor of political science at Columbia University. Hello, professor. Thank you for having me. The Democrats are now that capable of blocking president's agenda. What kind of trajectory in the future? Yes, you okay. will see a, a fundamental change um, because up till now, uh, the Trump administration has had it you know, fairly easy in terms of dealing with Congress. They haven't passed much legislation because their majorities were thin, but um, they didn't have to win over votes. Um, they fell short in their repeal of the Affordable Care Act, but they were able to get their way in other, other ways, through other means. Uh, they were able to pass a huge tax cut, and that was done on the on the basis of uh, holding majorities in both houses. But now um, things look altogether different. It is extremely unlikely that uh, unless there's a fundamental change in terms of bipartisan cooperation, which really does not seem likely, um, it's, it's hard to imagine any legislation emerging from Congress. And indeed, you know, one can expect um, some budget showdowns in coming uh, months um, over things like 
you know, whether to allocate money for a wall with the, with, on the Mexican border, um, how to allocate money for uh, national defense and other kinds of things that, are, that set Democrats and Republicans at each other's throats. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was scheduled to meet with his North Korean counterpart on the 8th, and it was canceled right after the polls closed. So do you think there is something the midterms has to do with this cancellation? No, it's, it's something altogether separate from the elections. Um, that is something that is wholly, in, it, it wholly controlled by the executive branch. So it has nothing to do with the legislature. Um, once these executive officials are, are confirmed by the Senate, they operate as part of the executive branch. So this is squarely in the hands of the Trump administration. And, and although um, the Foreign Affairs Committee and other kinds of committees in Congress could, if they wanted to, um, exercise some oversight over these kinds of things, um, it's not considered a primarily a legislative function. And if anything, your Korean listeners, it might be informative to them to remind them that foreign policy actions are really undertaken in the Senate, not the House. So the fact that President Trump now has a larger Republican Senate majority in the, to work with means that it will be easier for him to get whatever he needs to get done uh, through the Senate um, than would otherwise be the case. And that, I mean, I don't foresee any ratification of treaties or things like that on the horizon, but if it were to come to that, he would have a bigger majority to work with. Now, we've been talking about the role of the House and the Senate here with uh, Dr. Kim, and the Senate, now that it has more majority of the Republicans, does this mean that a lot of the foreign policy, which is decided in the Senate, won't be affected as much? Um, I'm talking about the scrapped Iran nuclear deal or the ongoing trade disputes with China, even the peace negotiations with North Korea. Of course, any kind of diplomatic activity is totally in the hands of the, you know, of the executives, so that's unaffected. Um, Treaty ratification, if it were to come to that, is now easier. Um, uh, executive branch appointments, because the Trump administration is famously um, tumultuous in terms of resignations and appointments, now that's easier than it was before. When it comes to scrapping treaty, that has become an executive function, although it is a kind of a questionable activity because it requires the Senate to ratify a treaty, but then to scrap a treaty you can do unilaterally, it's, it's a little weird. Um, and, and I think that that's kind of a gray area in, in American law. Thank you. That was Professor Donald Green from Columbia University. Now, James, how about on North Korea, the foreign policies towards North Korea? Do you think uh, President Trump will, will have some more hawkish uh, stance on North Korea after the midterms? There's a joker there, um, and that's North Korea. Uh, if the president is embroiled on this issue and he's not focusing on the Korean Peninsula, is it possible that North Korea might enter into another provocation cycle to bring the spotlight back onto the Korean Peninsula? Um, and if they decide to do that, uh, what will the reaction be from the United States? Would it be to re-engage with the North Koreans? Um, in a way that the Pyongyang wants uh, to engage with Washington? Or would they take the hardline route that President Trump was on in 2017? I think, given that the president now wants to deal with a situation here where the public um, seems to be turning against him, one very good reason for getting the public and the voting public to rally behind him is a crisis. And as long as he's not the one that's instigating this, and it's North Korea, um, then he would have a basis for, you know, drawing uh, a more energized support for a more hardline policy. Um, could that be a change in um, Trump administration's approach to North Korea? Well, if it turns from having Mike Pompeo be in the driver's seat for this for uh, Donald Trump, Instead, now it's the National Security Advisor, John Bolton, then, yeah, we, we may be in a very difficult situation here on the Korean Peninsula issue. So I think the North Koreans would want to play this very carefully uh, leading up. But at the same time, they don't want to lose this opportunity to get a deal, which the president clearly wants as well. So the question now is going to be what kind of deal, if any, we're going to get. It's possible that we just keep going like this, that... We don't get any substantive deals. All the parties 
to sit down for the sake of talking. It'll be interesting in the next coming months uh, how the U.S. administration pushes forward with this and how Pyongyang responds. Right. We'll keep a close eye on how the situations pan out after the elections. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It remains to be seen how the choices of American voters will impact the United States, not only on the domestic front, but also on the international stage. That's all we have for this week's The Point World Affairs. Thank you for tuning in and see you again next week.